So let me st start by saying, though, I'm, I'm, amazed, I'm enormously impressed by the commitment and the resilience of this group um, in staying with it for the entire day and not just staying with it, but being actively engaged in it for the entire day. And I just want to express my admiration to and for all of you and your efforts. Okay. Ready? What he meant was he tried to leave several times. <laughs> but I couldn't yeah, because but he couldn't. You, <laughs> you guys were still here. It's just, it's just the, way, the way it is. Um, first of all, before we get into the final discussion, uh, there's one thing I would like to do. Uh, often this gets left to the end and everybody's folding their coats and, and yeah, so forth. And I don't want to do it. Um, uh, actually, let, let me do one housekeeping thing first. At the conclusion of this session, upstairs, there will be a reception in the International Women's Commons. There, there's food there, as if you have not been fed enough, but there is more food. Um, and there are also beverages of a variety of sorts, uh, which may be more appropriate at that uh, hour. Um, not for Boko Haram. And in fact, Boko Haram is being excluded. Um, uh, just to add a certain degree of verisimilitude to what, what we're doing here. Boko Haram has gone home. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's an important point because this discussion is not for you and your roles. It's for you as each of yourselves as individuals. Secondly, the other thing I'd like to do is I would like to thank the people whose organizational skills made this possible. It is a very, very large group of people. I see Sharon Morris over there, but there is a great group of people here at USIP. And, 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 and in foreign policy. And, and Grace Rooney um, and the folks from foreign policy and Claire Casey and the folks from Garden Rothkopf um, and a lot of the uh, contractors and others who have come together, whether it's doing video or sound or whatever. There's a lot of moving parts here. I know it seems like just a casual, intimate conversation between friends, um, but none of it would be possible without all of them. So just one more round of applause for all of those Karen. people. Um, having said that, we're, we are not done. Uh, we really want to go and we want to provoke a discussion. And the main job of the gentleman to my right here at the front table is to help provoke that discussion by offering up some of their cross-cutting conclusions. Uh, but remember, we, uh, you know, none of you are obligated to speak here. All of you are encouraged to speak. And when I get up and we start moving around, what we're looking for are big ideas uh, from you as individuals. So you're not trapped in your role anymore. You don't have to be the World Bank uh, and struggle against the constraints of World Bank behavior, for example. Uh, but there's no better place to start this than with George. So. There you go. Might, might I defer until the end? Just as, as, as you see how this is working, <laughs> every time, every time I turn to him. But th I know. Let's put Jim Jeffrey on. Let's on put the spot Jim on the spot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> let, let, let him speak. Okay. Okay. Um, I would defer too, but too much <laughs> deferral is uh, uh, various themes uh, throughout this fascinating day. And once again, uh, David George, thank you very much for putting this together and for inviting me. Uh, one question that's kept coming up is, who is we? Uh, we, first of all, on a problem like this, is going to be the people in the government of Nigeria, the various actors inside the country. And that's always the case in a problem that is uh, discrete within a country, or to some degree in a region. But we is also us, the international community, as represented by the various uh, actors here, but also we in a larger sense of the United States and the West. Uh, first of all, and uh, Johnny did a great summary of how uh, Boko Haram getting out of control can threaten all of us. But beyond that, uh, what we're all about as a nation, as an international community in the UN Charter is to resolve problems like that. Uh, we all know that because looking around here, you've all lived that in one or another way. But that's part of the problem, and that's why I'll try to be a bit controversial in the next couple of minutes. Uh, essentially, most of the people here uh, have been sent out by one or another institution to carry out, or in the case of the media, report on uh, international or American or other efforts to 
uh, promote democracy, uh, resolve conflicts, stimulate economic development, build up government capabilities, and use all of that as part of our overall overarching uh, almost ideological security and uh, political agenda for the world. Uh, it's, at least in my case, as one who's done it, and I think in many others I've encountered, almost a secular religion. It's something we believe in and we should because it's been extremely successful since 1945, not just as mentioned at the beginning of this thing with the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding of South Korea, as we heard, but over the last particularly uh, 30 to 40 years, many parts of what we used to know as the third world have uh, become middle-income countries thanks to our institutions and our efforts and their own efforts. Uh, and so when we're presented with a problem, uh, to quote President Obama in his West Point speech, we tend to use the hammer that we're used to, which is all of these tools, all of these activities, all of these institutions, uh, to approach it. And in this particular case, the uh, nail that we're trying to hammer with this is a violent ideological movement. Uh, we've seen this in many incarnations uh, around the world. Uh, sometimes it's a civil war, sometimes it's a uh, ideological as or a religious movement, uh, an insurgency of one or another sort. Uh, but whether these tools really work, it's hard to say. Logically, it seems so because in the long run, uh, if we're successful in our agenda, and we've often been successful in our agenda in Central and South America and the Balkans and Southeast Asia, we dry up the underlying causes of uh, violent extremism and we don't really have that problem anymore. So there's a bias to uh, turn to uh, that, except that that's a long run solution and we're faced here today with a short run problem, not just uh, with Boko Haram, but in an awful lot of other areas and not just in the Middle East. Uh, think of the Ukraine. Uh, there are also tools that we're used to doing that even in the short run actually are pretty effective. And one of them that we talked about a bit this afternoon is democracy. And in my own experience, uh, regardless of the situation, people everywhere, regardless of their cultural backgrounds or their history or political uh, uh, views, kind of like to vote and will support efforts by us, the outside community, to try to give them fair elections. Uh, free media, while it's often under pressure, is something that's pretty much appreciated. Uh, getting money, however, including during the surge in Iraq, just bringing around bags of money and dumping it on tribal sheikh's uh, desks, uh, is often a very successful uh, policy. If you can link it up with things like jobs programs, even if it's clearing weeds out of canals, uh, that's helpful too. Uh, in conflict areas, and various other steps of this nature. There are thousands of them. Many of you have done them. But they probably are not going to get to the underlying uh, answer to something like Boko Haram. And looking at the relatively few resolutions of violent situations uh, around the globe in the last few decades uh, of this sort, you've got uh, Sri Lanka, in some cases a bad example, but it did end an insurgency. Uh, Northern Ireland, uh, what's going on with the PKK in Turkey, uh, and Colombia, uh, probably. Colombia, Colombia is a fourth one that was mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. You have uh, several common factors that reflect two things that we also heard about this afternoon. Internal situations made at home with the outside community to one or another degree, Colombia the most, Northern Ireland uh, somewhat, and in the others not too much helping, but still made internally. And secondly, uh, a set of ideas, what are you for if you're the government, if you're fighting an insurgency, if you're fighting some violent extremist group? Sometimes it's not all that good an answer. In Sri Lanka it was very much tied up with ethnicity. Sometimes in the Turkey of, to some degree to my surprise of uh, Recep Erdogan, it's trying to overcome ethnicity with the Kurds. But it's always some kind of strong answer that motivates a political system and frankly motivates the security forces. And that's the second thing. Security forces, this is among other things a security problem. It's other things but security is the leading bow wave of any movement like this and you have to have a countervailing security force of people who are willing to fight and die. And that's not easy. Uh, 
in my experience around the world, it has seldom been done by forces that have been trained by us to look like us. It's been done by Montagnards and Kurdish women and Kobani and Shia militias and other groups, some of which paramilitaries and such aren't all that nice, but they get the job done. Finally, and most importantly, it's strong local leadership. Very rarely, Bosnia comes to mind, uh, the international community comes up with a leader who can uh, uh, push the agenda, but typically it's a local leader who is able to seize the agenda, uh, mobilize the security forces, come up with a theme that makes at least part of the population believe that uh, he or she has a vision to go forward uh, and it's worth fighting for. Uh, without these elements, the things that we do from the outside, the election monitoring and the peacekeepers uh, and uh, economic development and the bags of money even, uh, can be helpful, but they're not going to get to the core problem. Thank you. Maksud. Well, I'd like to echo um, everyone who actually appreciated the excellent effort that was made today by all of you. Um, even those who are behind the scenes, uh, because I had the chance to speak to many of them and I, I had great insights. I have actually three main um, areas that I'd like to discuss with you and maybe share with you. The first is on violent extremism, and that's very much the area where I'm working in at the moment. The second element is narrative, counter-narrative, and beyond. And this is something I think we've discussed today, but it's important as to where we're going with all of this. And finally, talking about the importance of developing the international peace strategist. We need to have peace strategists and what it means uh, in the long run, especially in light of the peace games. Regarding the first element, which is on violent extremism, um, I I've noticed there are many discussions over violent extremism and what are the expectations, etc. Uh, frankly speaking, there are several things to be considered uh, and are very important for us to continue to acknowledge these things. A, to counter violent extremism, it needs to be multidimensional by default. There is no one single factor or variable that can explain violent extremism, nor there is one solution that fits everything or one tablet that will solve all the diseases of the world. Unfortunately, it's so complicated that it requires some level of sophistication on our behalf to A, understand, and B, to intervene. And that's not an easy job. Also, the discussions over the role of economy in countering violent extremism, the role of religion in countering violent extremism, the role of ideology in countering violent extremism, I think the key point here, especially the linkage between ideology slash religion, it's not about what you believe in or what you embrace or what kind of even political grievances you use to justify. It is about how on earth can you justify the killing, the use of violence against innocent people. And therefore, it's important that when we deal with these issues, that we don't confuse personal choices of faith or political orientation or whatever decisions they make with the fact that whatever they embrace or believe or worldview they share or have or endorse, that this should not ever justify the use of violence against innocent people. And we need to separate these two and come up with solutions or ideas around this. Otherwise, we'll go into a path where it might be very confusing. For public sphere and public exchange of debates and ideas, this is where we can debate if it's true to believe or not to believe or not being affiliated with any belief at all or if you endorse this economic model or that economic model, if it works or not. We need to let things for political or public discussions and debate within the social realm. But when it comes to the use of any of the above for basically harming and killing in the name of all these ideals, I think it's important we have clarity and distinction uh, on these matters. Also, one of the interesting issues related to violent extremism, which are very dear to me personally, and I always talk about this in many occasions before, is not about countering violent extremism because this always puts us in a position where we're always responding, reacting, instead of actually being proactive and setting the stage and setting the tone for what is needed to be done. Therefore, we always talk about positive CVE or even better, alternative CVE, and the things that we can do and how we can think out of the box. Uh, one of the gentlemen I spoke to, uh, Malcolm, uh, he told me about some of the stories of 
using the role of women or community or youth looking at the different elements of society in large, the different ideas that could be produced or presented. Therefore, I think we have so much in our disposal to explore that is not yet being touched or even mentioned during the day, which I think is worthy of looking at from a different perspective. Then the second component is the issue of the narrative, counter-narrative, and beyond. Again, when you look at what people are presenting in terms of what they're advocating for, and I always say this in different meetings, basically those who are, unfortunately, but they're constantly promoting a culture of death, a culture of destruction, a different worldview. The alternative is maybe to provide some sort of a culture of promotion of life, promotion of construction. It's a very simple equation. There is a vacuum. The youth needs to have some sort of purpose or identity, and then someone else provide them with the alternative. Unless we do something about this, as in being proactive in terms of providing what is the alternative. Is it true that this is the end of history? Is it true that the human potential is at the moment unable, incapable of producing anything new? I don't believe in that. Personally, I'm a very boring classical modernist, and I think there's still more to go forward. And it's too early to say this is it for Homo sapiens, they can't move forward. Therefore, when it comes to I mean, understanding there's refreshments that. afterwards, we know that, so. Well, I'm flying tonight, so oh, I need so to say I, everything yeah. I need to say before I come back to the great Washington. And it, it is a great Washington. And, and, and basically, one of the main ideas that I would like to share with you um, today is not to be limited or locked with existing axioms, how people define or understand von extremism or understand narrative, or we have to counter narrative. I think we need to go beyond that. What is it that we are promoting? What is it that we want? In classical psychological literature, if you want your children to go sleep home early, you don't tell them, don't stay late, but you promote the behavior you want from them. They want to go sleep early. So if you ask a violent extremist, I don't want you to be a violent extremist, it's bad for your health to be a violent extremist. The question would be from their side, so what do you want me to be? What's the alternative? Well, I want you to be a critical thinker. I want you to be culturally intelligent. I want you to be open to different ideas. Be creative, be innovative in your own way, and stop before you actually think doing any kind of harm to others, and basically provide them with the alternative. And this is a big challenge, a challenge on us collectively. Finally, and I thank you for your patience, is basically that a real takeaway from this exercise, and I've been really in a position of honor and privilege to join for the second time, is basically promoting this mindset of having the international peace strategist. Just the way there are the war games where all of these great generals come together and start strategizing. Just the way we had great generals like, for example, Klausowitz in a big fat book called On War, strategizing about how to defeat the enemy and deal with that, that's fine. But can we have also great peace strategists, those who can promote a different approach to things? This is a time of our history where we reach a certain point of civility, where we realize that the ultimate and absolute sense of reasoning and rationalism is to go beyond our own biological urges to kill and shoot and run, basically to build sustainable cultures and be able to move forward with our understanding collectively as humans. There's still more to be done. We as a group of people, we're a sample of what's happening outside in the world, but I believe that there's so much that we can do only if we are able to truly look at things from a different perspective, a perspective other than what's actually being produced and explained. Thank you. Thank you. Extreme, extremely uh, helpful and relevant. And I hope somebody in the room said, you know, I'm going to go write on peace. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it just seems like a publishing opportunity. Um, but I, but I, I, I think those are exactly the themes that we're here for, and I think they frame it in a really important way. Uh, Johnny? Uh, David, thank you. Uh, I think this is an extraordinarily uh, important uh, occasion, talking about an extraordinarily uh, important uh, issue uh, in an extraordinarily uh, uh, important country. Uh, today we are approximately two months 
and 10 days uh, before the first uh, round of the Nigerian elections on February uh, 14th, uh, 2015. And I can think of no more uh, an important discussion for us here in Washington than to be talking about uh, the most uh, important uh, country in Africa, uh, the continent's uh, largest uh, democracy, uh, largest uh, economy, and a country uh, that we want to see remain uh, strong and unified, and not one that collapses uh, into civil war or uh, Christian-Muslim uh, strife. Um, let me uh, say uh, a few things about uh, what I've heard uh, over the last day and night and also uh, at the end posit uh, a few recommendations. Uh, first of all, we know that uh, extremism is indeed a uh, global uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's not exclusive to uh, one region uh, of the world, and certainly what is happening in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, is not uh, unique. That said, based on a lot of things that we've heard uh, over the course of the day and last night, uh, that uh, there are uh, uh, some things uh, that we should all remember. Uh, there is no, uh, I think, uh, as one of my colleagues at USIP said earlier today, there is no cookie cutter uh, solution uh, to be uh, found. Uh, the processes uh, for uh, building uh, peace uh, should be locally uh, owned. Uh, that said, uh, the international uh, community does have uh, a role uh, to play, uh, but it is in fact uh, not the dominant role uh, and it is not the most important role, but it is clearly a role that we must take responsibility for. Equally, uh, in most of these cases, uh, a military uh, only or a security response only solution will not work. Uh, focusing specifically on Nigeria, the Boko Haram problem, as we all know, has been caused by a variety of political, uh, economic, uh, and sociological and historical factors. Therefore, a multiple set of solutions uh, will have to be uh, used to resolve uh, this problem. It will take uh, a long time to implement many of these solutions, but that does not mean that there are not immediate things that we cannot do today, tomorrow, next week, and next month to ameliorate uh, the situation. Uh, it uh, is uh, important to remember uh, the drivers uh, of uh, this uh, conflict. These drivers must, in fact, uh, be addressed uh, if we are to see an end uh, to this. And we know what these uh, drivers are. Uh, their poor governance, their political and economic uh, corruption, their massive, massive youth unemployment uh, in the Northeast and the North uh, in general, the need for the restoration of economic growth and opportunity uh, across the North, the need to uh, empower uh, the 50% uh, of the population who were frequently left out, and that's women the need to, uh, uh, to revitalize the country's uh, infrastructure, the need to uh, ensure that there is public service delivery, and most importantly, a need to revitalize public trust, 
between the government, both at the national and the regional level, and the citizens that they represent. All of these things must, in fact, uh, be uh, uh, addressed. The, we also have to remember, and do deference to the uh, ambassador, that uh, uh, in proposing uh, uh, counter extremist narratives, uh, we must make sure that the counter narrative is not simply rhetorical, but is in fact uh, real. Nothing is more uh, destructive than to have a counter narrative which is counterfactual, uh, which in fact uh, is not based uh, in both uh, reality and a real sense that it can uh, be achieved and meaningful uh, for the person. We also need uh, constantly, wherever we can, uh, to find uh, uh, partners. We need uh, reliable, honest, principled partners uh, at every level, uh, both at the national, the regional level, in and outside uh, of government. And we must always seek uh, to help uh, empower those partners uh, without taking away their ownership of the issue. And we also need to find ways to uh, identify uh, spoilers uh, and to signal them out uh, and to sanction them uh, if uh, necessary. Uh, I started off by saying we were two months and two weeks uh, away from probably uh, Africa's uh, most important elections in Africa's most uh, important uh, country. Uh, a nation of uh, 177 uh, million people, which if the UN uh, is right, will be a nation uh, of 400 million uh, in less than 35 years' time. Uh, a nation that today uh, is creating more new citizens through birth than all of Western Europe from Sweden down to the tip of Sicily and all the way from the Polish border to the Portuguese peninsula. This is a country that we cannot afford uh, to ignore. It's not a country that we can afford to see slip over the edge uh, of the table into the abyss. It is a country for which there is not a single universal 911 number that can be called to pull it out of the fire should it fall in. And therefore, prevention, prophylaxis, and early action are required. If we don't do it now, we will not be able to successfully do it after it has begun to burn. Uh, it is a time uh, for higher level political engagement uh, from uh, Nigeria's democratic partners, those in Washington, in London, in Berlin, in Paris, in Brussels. It is not after the last slide on the second scenario has materialized. It's not after the country has begun uh, to burn and disintegrate. The time is now for the prevention, for the uh, operating theater uh, is not large enough to take uh, the work that will have to be done uh, to salvage this. So. Uh, the uh, thought is uh, there uh, is that, uh, again, uh, action uh, clearly is uh, required uh, right now. Uh, those uh, who uh, in three or four months uh, say that they weren't warned should stay and say they were based on part of what has happened, to happened here today. Uh, the, the warning uh, signals are out there. The lights have been blinking bright yellow for some extended uh, period of 
of time. Uh, no one will be able to say that they were not warned about this crisis. Thank, thank you very much. We've got about 12 minutes left, actually. So what I'm going to do is uh, all of you have had a chance to speak. I'm not going to ask each of you to speak for 11 seconds. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ways that we can follow up on this and you can continue to deliver these messages to a large audience in a moment. Uh, but before I do that, let me turn to George for a final set of remarks. No, thank you, David, and thanks, thanks to all of you. And I can be brief because, indeed, my colleagues uh, before me have already said much of what I wanted to say. Is that why you deferred until the end? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. That's precisely. Um, uh, but it's also, I wanted to say something about the value of this exercise. Um, and uh, this is not said in a self-congratulatory way because I had nothing to do with the conception of it. Indeed, uh, this was something that Kristen Lord and David conceived over coffee, I'm told, some afternoon. It was actually lunch at the Palm. Over, uh, well, I, was, <laughs> I was going to, but, but was, I think. It was better than that. <laughs> even better than that. Um, some of us have had experience in, in, with other kinds of scenarios. I recall very vividly the shell scenarios in South Africa. I recall also the use and the utility of scenarios that were done to show projections on what would happen if HIV AIDS were not addressed in the African context. And, and one of the things that, that those scenarios do is that they, they show us what the possibilities, for better or worse, are if certain things are allowed uh, to, to continue on their course. And certainly the conversation that we've had here today strongly indicates that that if something is not done urgently to address the drivers that we have seen, the outcome is going to be predictable and predictably nasty. Um, and so one of the values of these scenarios is indeed to inform us uh, of how we ought to change our current behavior. We started out, I, I would dare say, somewhat prosaically uh, saying uh, we were constrained very much by the, um, by the realities of the current situation. But as we progressed through this, we saw that those constraints only increased over time, that the possibilities for constructive and positive action only became more and more limited until the final slide, as Johnny points out, that if, you know, by that time, we are clearly um, dealing in the most reactive way with a most disastrous scenario. So what should that say to us? It should say to us, as Johnny has already suggested, that the time for action is now. We still have opportunities and possibilities, and I'm pleased to say that in the course of the conversation, we did indeed identify a number of specific and concrete kinds of things that we could perceive. So that's one thing that this conversation today should, should help us uh, uh, realize and understand. But I think there are also other ways in which we can use this exercise today, and that is in our conversations with our other interlocutors. And I'm thinking particularly uh, of uh, the Nigerian government and with the Nigerian opposition. Because at the end of the day, it seems to me that, that if, if there is to be a, a, a real change in the dynamic, it's going to have to come out of, um, of some kind of an understanding between the political, the key political actors in Nigeria, that this flow of events serves neither of their interests and the only uh, set of actors that's going to benefit out of this is Boko Haram. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what... They're, they're not actually Boko Haram. Oh, I know no, you're no, pointing... They, 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 I, I understand. I'm okay. trying to illustrate it. Okay. <laughs> but, but the point is that, I mean, it seems to me one of the clear things that comes out of this is that we need to be looking for points of convergence among the principal political actors in Nigeria that would change the dynamic in this current situation that does not lead us to that final slide on the home show. So uh, I simply wanted to say that, and I hope that we will find ways, both in the way we write up the results of this, that we, use it, that we can use it in ways in our conversations, our respective conversations with others. The last point is, is the notion of the strategy, the peace strategy and the peace strategist. Needless to say, USIP likes to think of itself as being precisely in that role. But we also are aware that, you know, that doesn't happen without the broader cooperation of a great many other actors. But it does say to us that we need to stop thinking about 
ourselves in isolation in our particularly um, highly circumscribed and defined roles and start looking for ways for the various um, um, agencies and organizations represented around this table to have a conversation precisely about a peace strategy. And so I, I hope that all of those things are things that flow from this uh, enormously important initiative that you put in place. Today. Well, th thank you very much, George. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, the intention, oh, you can applaud for George. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I think it'd be rude not to applaud for George, um, but um, I, because we are here in his house and this has been a remarkable day, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I thought perhaps we would end up with a little bit more dialogue. Everybody here has really participated actively. You've been a terrific group, uh, not just because you've participated actively, but because you've brought to the discussion an enormous amount of experience, depth, uh, and many, many perspectives. And I include the audience who participated in this as well. Uh, I think this is one of the great things about this. Uh, and one of the things that amplifies what George is saying and what uh, Maksud and, and Jim and, and Johnny were saying is that whatever ideas we may have come up with, and all of us view this through our own eyes and see it in different perspectives, all of you will now go out from here and you will take those things and you will share them with other people. All of you will have had experience, this experience, interacting with one another, cross-pollinating ideas, and you will take that and share it with other people. You know, we've done some remarkable things today, and I'm glad Yusuf is here because, you know, it, it couldn't happen without the support of the United Arab Emirates and the embassy here, um, but it's already had a broad impact. We, we joked a little bit about this, but the reality is, that um, it was one of the top trending topics on Twitter all day in Washington, D.C. So it was having a social media impact. It was live streamed, so it was reaching out to the world and people will be able to view this wherever they are, whenever they want to, via the live streaming. Um, uh, foreign Policy has a peace channel, which is part of this whole project, where articles about the peace game will appear, have appeared, where summary of this peace game will appear, and that reaches three to four million people each month around the world. I am inviting each of you right at this particular moment that to participate in the Peace Channel. The purpose of this channel is to increase the dialogue about peace and peace strategies and ideas for peace so that we give it the kind of attention that most organizations typically give to war. So send me the articles. Tom Stackpole is up there. There he is, waving his hand. He's one of the people who edits the Peace Channel. And send him the in fact, send him the articles. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but he and Sayward Darby, who was a senior editor, will, will go through this and help pull together your pieces so that we have an ongoing discussion. We'll have the meeting in Abu Dhabi in June. We will continue to have meetings, although one of our great innovations here is the thought last night that perhaps next year we will do the Abu Dhabi meeting, Abu Dhabi meeting in December and the, and the Washington <laughs> meeting in May or June. You see what we did there? You know, so that we, you know, we only have to do this two or three times before we come up with that kind of thinking. Um, we should get a bunch of experts together for a few days and finally you, the light bulb goes off. But um, in, in, in any event, we will have those meetings on an ongoing basis. Obviously, we hope this is something that continues onward and onward, that the scenarios get better, that the approaches get better, that we try new ideas, that we think outside the box, and that we actually become collaborators in the development of this idea that Maksud so eloquently laid out there of being peace strategists, of developing the counter narratives in a constructive way that are not counterfactual, um, that we uh, can take the tools and the networks and the, 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 the abilities that all of us have in this room and amplify that out through all of these other things and actually start having as many constructive conversations about peace as we do about conflict. And you know, this goes, uh, and I will conclude with, you know, the point that George just made if there is any, you know, we, we, we don't do these scenarios to come up with a magic solution. There is no magic solution. In fact, very often in these cases, we have found 
that the perfect is the enemy of the good, that people will say, we will not take action because we do not know clearly who we should be acting with. We will not take action because there are great risks here and we might not be completely successful. We will not take action because we are not sure what that action will actually bring in the long run. And one thing that these scenarios demonstrate unequivocally, time and time again, is that when you embrace that view, you make it certain that it will be harder to take action in the future that the action will be less successful in the future, and that you will be dealing not with keeping the peace or preser preserving the peace or extending peace. You will be dealing with conflict. You will be dealing with ending a war and cleaning up with the catastrophe that that often produces. So you know, if that is the only thing we take away, that we must act now, that we must be creative, that we must think outside the box, that peace strategy deserves as much time and bandwidth as war strategy, then we will be doing something extremely valuable. We couldn't do it without the U.S. Institute of Peace. We couldn't do it without the support of the embassy of the UAE. We couldn't do it without all of you. And that's why we hope you will contribute to the Peace Channel going forward. That's why we hope that you will return for these future events when they're done in the right place at the right time of year. Um, and uh, we, that's why we hope that you